Good morning. How's everyone doing? Good morning. Good morning, Professor. Good morning. Good morning. Give it a couple more minutes for people to uh to come through. How y'all how y'all doing from yesterday to today? You said tired? Mm -hmm. Yes, because I finish work at 11 p.m. So I'm sorry, I'm eating breakfast too. Um, you said you said you went to sleep. You got home after 11 p.m. Yes. Oh wow. Mm -hmm. well, what, I mean, if, if you don't mind us, mind me asking, what what kind of work? Like, what do you? Uh, I work at the supermarket. Okay. So, I have to check um I don't know how to say that in English. <laughs> um you have to you uh to leave the limpia la línea. No, uh chequear las mercancías de las líneas. Okay, so like cleaning out the merchandise and stuff? Yeah, like a price, uh labels, signs. I have to do everything. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean that takes a lot of time too. It's a lot of time, a lot of work. <laughs> yes. Yesterday I was in um in Target mm -hmm. over by uh by Riverdale and the line was like it looked like you was going to the line for a club like on a Saturday night or something like that. I was like, hey, Diantra, what the hell is going on over here? <laughs> that joint took that joint caught me like like literally like I had to walk up the line, then I had to walk down all the way down to Target to, to wow. the outside of Target. Then I had to make another left and go all the way down that side. And it was just, I mean, the, the line moved pretty fast. I'll give it that. So, you know, it ended up being like a 20 minute, 15, 20 minute line. But uh, when you first see it, you're like, I do your smear. What am I doing here? And I only had like, I only had like five items. Everybody had like carts. At least this is like worth them being on the line or whatever. Like I only had like five items and they didn't have an express lane. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I mean, I'm just saying, like, when I was on the line, like, there were these two, uh, these two men that, like, when I was on the line, like, it was like, oh, my God. And then literally, like, they just bust out laughing when they see that the line just continues going. And literally, like, with the, without them even seeing me, like, I'm laughing because I'm like, I feel your pain, bro. Like, I feel your pain. You know what I'm saying? But it's just, it's just it right now. Uh, anybody else have any interesting corona related stories, uh, COVID-19, quarantine stories, anything like that? Um, the cases went up. Yeah, yeah, the cases definitely um, went I think the cases went up in Florida 3,000, like they have a uh, new case. 3,000 new cases, and New York have 600 new cases. Yeah. I mean, in, in Florida, because they reopened, they reopened the beaches like in certain places. Like Miami, when I was there, they didn't reopen anything because that's like a main, that's like a major city in Florida. So they're not really trying to mess around too much with, you know, taking certain risks. But like other places like Jacksonville or Jupiter or whatever, like they opened up and like like after Memorial Day, um, after Memorial Day weekend, there was like over two thousand cases over there. So you know, it's like and um, they also said that um, they thinking about putting a lockdown for Florida and Texas. And they also thinking about it for New York too. Yeah, I mean, Florida and Texas, I I can see it going either way because um, in Florida, I mean, especially like because you know when we think of Florida, we think of like Miami or you know some of these big cities, but in reality, Florida, like to get from one place to another, is like you have to drive like it's very far um, distance wise. So. You pr you do a better job social distancing in certain southern states than 
obviously up here in the north where like everything is done through public transport and stuff like that. Like I have I have a vehicle here in New York and to be honest, I barely use it, you know. Um, but it's just like in, in Florida and especially in Texas, because Texas is huge. Like Texas could be a, a country on its own. Um they they have so much uh they have so much real estate over there that it's like the cases are very low considering the number of people that live in Texas and then obviously um in general because everything is so far apart from each other, you know what I'm saying? So you have to drive like in order for you to get corona, you have to make an effort to get corona in, in, in Texas. Where like in in somewhere like New York, like you might not even know how you got it if you ended up getting it because everything is so close to each other, you know, you kinda you, you you're kinda gonna be exposed whether you want to or not, especially if like like New York has so many buildings, like if you live in a if you live in a building and you know what I'm saying, for whatever reason you gotta leave the apartment to, you know, do groceries or get your mail or something like that. Odds are you gotta be in an elevator or take stairs or open doors to go down the stairs that maybe somebody who had a corona touch or was was in at some point, you know. So um, all of these things kind of just, you know, it just, I don't know, it, it just makes for an interesting dynamic overall. Um, so today we're going to be talking about gentrification, uh, but before that, because summer one already went flying, like we're already in week four, okay? Um, I wanted to ask, like, do y'all have any any questions, any concerns about um, your, you know, how you're doing assignments, your reflections? Like, I'm gonna, I, I already graded a bunch of reflections, I think it was last week or sometime before. Now I'm running through this batch of reflections that y'all submitted from like, last week and what have you but um so what those are those on discussion boards uh could, could you repeat that the reflection and they're the discussion boards like you know how we like the questions and stuff those are the discussion board are you talking about like the um how you call it uh, the assignment from blackboard or is it like a different one or i don't know how to make the um the reflections when you go in the course materials, you click on the individual weeks, and then under each specific day, those days have an assignment underneath them. So th okay. those 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 are the reflections. Oh okay okay. Yeah, um yeah y'all y'all know how y'all know where to locate y'all know where to locate and find the reflections right? Yes. Yeah, I know how to I know how to do it. It's that it's like two. There's one where I asked you, do we have to write our own questions and people answer it? And then the other one is the one you're talking about. Yeah, the one with the questions, that's the discussion board. If, okay. if, you, if you already put the question for, uh, for the topic you were assigned, then, then you're good. Um, of course, you know, comment and provide feedback on other people's um, discussion questions so that that way you can accumulate points. I'm not requiring for you to have to respond to other people, but if you do, obviously it's just gonna help you out with points and stuff like that. Um, but the things that are a must, if you wanna you know, do good in the class is, I mean, the main things is the final paper and the final presentation. Um, so we're about a week and a half away from that. So basically like a week and a half, two weeks, um, but we're starting that on week six. And then, um, what's it called? We have the reflection assignments, you know, and obviously participating, being in on the Zoom sessions, and then also the uh, discussion board. But if you already did the discussion board question, then you're good, you know. Obviously, just respond to the questions. That's going to rack up your participation as well. But if you're already in the Zooms and stuff like that, like, you know, so that's going to be the main form of, gaining participation points. Um, so I'm going to go over the final paper and the final presentation again real quick. 
Um, so the rubrics, they're already posted up on, on Blackboard. I should uh, scroll the chat. So, uh, they're already on Blackboard, of course. So let me switch this to student view. All you have to do to get the information for the, uh, for the final assignments for the paper and the presentation, go to the course information. It's also in the course material. I put it in more than one place so that it's easier for you to get that information. Um, and then basically, obviously here it gives you the grades for like the different types of assignments. Right here you find the final assignments, presentation rubric, and uh, research paper outline. Well, I, I, need to, I need to edit that. Basically just the research paper is not the outline. Um, so right here you can see the hyperlinks, which those are the PDF. Uh, as well actually when i met research paper outline like i was provide like this pdf right here is the it's just the outline for you to follow uh for the research paper so basically once you click on on these two is you know we already went over the rubric early on in the semester um the rubric is basically helping you understand how to do the the presentation obviously you're not limited to just doing the powerpoint or or whatever. I'm, I'm gonna just click on it just to make it easier. Because I want to make sure that we understand what's happening so that that way, you know, we don't have as many questions on the days leading up. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start with the research paper first because your final presentation is based off of the research paper. Um, this is gonna be due on the last day of class, so on the 2nd of July. Um, which is right around the corner. So basically, if you haven't if you haven't started working on the paper already, um, which if you provided an outline um, for for the research paper, like some of you, like when you prov like when I when we first got to that specific topic, um, where the one of the assignments was to provide an outline. If you did it in that same week, like I probably already gave you back. Um, feedback and you know most of y'all were green light it was a go um i'm gonna run through the remaining outlines today so you guys are gonna have that information to go off of but at the end if you haven't started on your research paper or at least on certain parts of it i would highly suggest for you to start on it now because you got the rest of this week you got all of next week and then for the research paper you still technically have another Four weeks, so you have like two and a half weeks, but you want to get started on it ASAP because in the beginning of um, of week six, that's when you're going to have to start doing the presentations, all right? And because the presentation is based off your final paper, uh, you want to make sure that you have at least a good amount of your final paper done so that that way you know what to put in your presentation. That makes sense? Yeah. Happy. Um, Professor, I have a question. Yeah. Um, if we write more than six pages, uh, we can get like extra credit for that. <laughs> um, because the thing is, you already have all these different reflection assignments, um, and you know, if you if you do more than ten reflection assignments, I'll give you extra credit for that. But I want you to keep it between five to six pages for the research paper because it'll help you stay focused on your topic. It'll keep you from, from talking too much about this or talking too much about that. I want you to learn how to develop communication while you're doing this, all right? Um, five to six pages is more than enough in order for you to get the information you need on paper. Um, the, the, ta the challenge that I'm putting for you is to know how to organize your thoughts in a way where it can fit into these five to six pages. So that's that's the reason why I want this to be no less than five and no more than six because ultimately, if, if you're going to go to John Jay 
And then if you plan on going to grad school, law school, whatever, whatever you plan on going after that, you have to learn how to maintain your thoughts in a certain structure anyways. You know what I'm saying? Um, and a lot of professors, once you, once you step out of BMCC, they're probably not really going to, you know, give you the, the opportunity to like learn these things in the same way that you're having them at BMCC where it's like, okay, it's all right for you to, to fail and to not understand things and then, you know what I'm saying, come back and do better. In some of these schools or some of these classes, and I'm not saying for all of them, but you know, a school like John Jay, like it's it, it got that name for a reason. Um, people are gonna just expect for you to already know this stuff. And if you don't provide what they're expecting of you or, or what they're asking of you, you know what I'm saying? Like it's it's not their job. The way that they're gonna say it is it's not their job to, you know, feel sympathy or empathy. I'm just giving the work and you provide me a message. You know what I'm saying? So there might not be a second chance. So over here, I want you to kind of just figure out how to kind of like fall and get get back up or whatever if if that were the case. If you also want to, you know, if it gives you peace of mind and security, you could send me your final research paper in advance and just for me to look over it and review and kind of give you feedback and then you can resubmit it as a final after that. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. But in, in regards to having more than six pages, let's stay away from doing that because, like I said, I want you to have very concise, uh, precision-based thoughts, you know? Because when you, when you make an argument about whatever point that you're being passionate about, because that's why I left the, the topic open to y'all, because I want you to pick something that you're passionate about, something that you really love talking about, even if it's even if it's a messed up topic, but it's something that you feel strongly about, which obviously that means you care a lot about it. I want you to go in on it and pick out your best points, put it in the paper. You know what I'm saying? This is why this is an issue going on uh, in the criminal justice system as it concerns the urban community. Ah, ah, and then you come up with your solution. You know what I'm saying? Like before before stating the issue, you come up with the history, the timeline of the issue, and all that stuff bring out examples as to why it's an issue, bring out statistics, and then after that, you provide a very concise solution. This is the solution to police brutality, uh, whether it's, you know, wh whatever option you think, whether it's defunding the police and reallocating it to communities of color, or more training, or, you know, making it unlawful to turn off body cams because that's considered destruction of evidence. Whatever you think your solution is, like, I, I want you to just go hard in whatever you want. I'm not here to judge on whether what you're saying is right or wrong. I just want you to come up with your arguments, your statistics, your facts. Obviously, people can, you can always argue different sides of things, but whatever side you pick, I want you to go hard in that um, so that that way I can just assess your thinking. I'm already looking at your thinking process and the way that you, you communicate your information. Um, so I'm going to go over this real quick, and then I'm going to open it up for questions in regards to if you got questions towards the research paper. Um, so you will complete a five to six page research paper individually or in a group of up to four. So if you do this in a group of two or more, keep in mind that you will all get the same grade regardless of who put what amount of work in and stuff like that. So just keep that in mind. Um, you will complete a five to six page research paper and make an, argue, an, an argument critiquing some aspect of the criminal justice system as it concerns the urban community. So this is specifically about CJ and the urban community. Obviously, uh, we've seen the events that have been happening recently. Uh, when we talk about the urban community, that's basically white folk vocabulary for saying the hood. <laughs> the hood or just like communities of color in general. Um, and so, Basically, just focusing on any issue. It could be police-related issues. It could be prison-related issues. It could be, um, you know, policy. Whatever you think you want to talk about or need to talk about, as, as long as it always goes back and relates to the urban community, you good. You good money, all right? Um, you can use any of the topics on the syllabus, or if you have a topic outside of the syllabus that you want to explore, just run it by me real quick, you know what I'm saying, and I'll give you the, 
the okay, or I'll be like, eh, you know, maybe you should think about something else. Um, basically, you just need at least three sources. You don't have to use the BMCC library. I, I just had that there for the sake of having it there. But you just need at least three sources on your topic to produce the final paper. The format is, is double space, size scroll font, Times New Roman, and include the headers uh, with the page numbers. So just to be clear, and that's why I have it here where it says body of work, it says five to six pages. That's the five to six pages. The cover page does not count as one page, and work cited page does not count as two pages. All right? Those are just there to be there. The, the, the main work is the body of work. All right, because I know when you put the header in the top, it's going to consider the cover page as page one. No, that's page zero. Okay, well, that's that's not a page. The first page is where you start with the introduction and then you go on from there. So obviously, you're going to have the cover page pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Um, and then you have the body of work. So the intro, you know, state the purpose of the research paper within the first paragraph. So right off the rip, you're telling me. This is what my topic is going to be about, uh, and this is what motivated the research. Boom. That's your first paragraph, and that's your intro. After that, we get into history. So if you're talking about police brutality, which I know a lot of people might want to talk about that now, um, basically, you're going to go through the history of policing and how you think history details where policing has led up to now. So. You know, if you're going to talk about police brutality, bringing up the slave patrol, that's a pretty big historical point to, to talk about. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like that's the origin of where policing comes from. So it kind of makes sense why police brutality exists um, if you look at it from that perspective. Then obviously you're going to pull out other cases where you pull up uh, the Rodney King case, Trayvon Martin, Eric Gardner. Obviously you can use the recent examples and you can use the protests that have been happening and, you know, saying stuff like that. You can put all that in the history to kind of just lay out the history. Um, you know what I'm saying? You could do that in like a little over half a page to a page, whatever. Um, the statement, I would say, you know, focus about a page and a half to maybe two pages on that. Like really it's up to your discretion. You know what I'm saying? I'm just giving you these numbers as to how many pages just to kind of help you balance or figure out okay what's a good amount to put what to include but it's all up to you at the end of the day um the statement basically you're stating your case for the criticism to be considered um this includes examples so i just mentioned in a few examples you know if you want to use uh how racial profiling has affected you know people in the community of course we're, we're going to talk about the central park five like that would be an example that you could obviously include, um, you can use court hearings from that Central Park Five Chagas case, um, stuff directly in court transcripts and put, draw it out and put it into your paper. Um, you can use statistics, for example, if we're still on the topic of police brutality, police kill over a thousand people, over a thousand people on a yearly basis, you know, something like that, or over 70% of police are white. Um, you know, using whatever statistics are going to assist you or benefit your argument, go ahead and include those, you know. So it could be examples, statistics, testimonials, court hearings, or negative outcomes, which obviously, you know, you could talk about how it leads to fatality in, in a lot of cases. Um, and then, of course, you have the proposed solution slash alternative. So basically just use statistics and facts. Now that you already stated what the issue is and you laid out the history, what is the what is the solution? Is there proof that your solution has actually worked on a smaller scale? For example, if you think community policing is the solution, use statistics as to how community pol policing has actually reduced, um, you know, police brutality and, you know, these kinds of conflicts and stuff like that. Um, you should keep your solution at about one page so that that way you can have enough information to just get straight to the solution, but not overwhelm the paper with just solution after solution as well. So I would say have one main solution. If you want to include, you know, another side solution, like another one or two side solutions, just to kind of like pad on to your, 
you know, to your alternative, that's fine. But focus mainly on at least one, maybe two solutions top. All right. Um, and then the conclusion is basically one final paragraph to close out your whole argument. You're reiterating the issue at hand and how the, uh, the proposed solution slash alternative can improve things. And at the bottom, you have different resources, you know, from BMCC, you got the BMCC library guides. And I do suggest um, for you to check with the writing center to see if they're open or if they're available. And you know what I'm saying? If not, at least do spell check <laughs> during during your um, during your final paper. So like I said, if you wanna send me your drafts in advance, I'd be more than happy to go over it and to get back at you and let you know, hey, you know, I think this is cool, or I think you, you know, you could do this differently, or whatever, whatever. So, obviously, the sooner the better. Um, don't send it to me like one day before the final date and think that I can get it to you that fast. Like, try to do this, you know, at least at the very least by the beginning of week six, but really like by next week if you can. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you wanted to um, to get that that feedback from me in regards to, like, the final paper before it's actually done. Y'all got any questions, any comments or concerns? Uh, if um, you're choosing to do the documentary, how long do you suggest it be? Question. So, if you wanted to start a documentary, um, you could just provide the link for the documentary. I mean, you type out what the documentary is, and then you provide the link, obviously, and stuff like that. I would say provide at least one article as well that supports that documentary, so that that way it kind of shows it shows the documentary's validity. Because I know a lot of professors they don't want to they don't want to hear all oh, you know documentaries not valid this and that, but. That's the, that's the times we live in. Like, people learn more visually than they did from reading a book in today's society. At least, like, the, the you know what I'm saying, the, the newer generation of students and stuff like that. So, um, just provide me the name of the documentary, you know, cite it, reference it in the work cited page. And then, if you can, at least find one article that, that references that documentary just to show its validity. No, I mean, I'm making my own documentary. Oh, you're making your own, but that's for the um for the presentation though, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we're gonna get to the presentation right now. I just wanted to cover the the research paper first. So like, so what we're gonna get to the presentation right now. But is there any questions specifically towards the the research paper? All right, so next we're gonna get into, uh, what's it called? The presentation. So here originally I put that it's a 15 minute presentation. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> 15 minutes is a, is a pretty long time. Uh, originally I had that for the class because 15 minutes, 15 minutes in person can go by pretty fast. Um, Really, just keep it at about, you know, seven minutes, your, your presentation. Um, if you wanted to do a PowerPoint presentation, that's fine. Of course, again, you're basing the presentation off of your final paper. So whatever you did your final paper on, that's basically what your presentation is going to be talking about. If you're doing a PowerPoint presentation, there's not a minimum or maximum amount of slides that you need to have. But obviously, don't underdo it and don't overkill at the same time because you only have a certain amount of time. Um, I will say no less than three slides because I know some people can just memorize their information and just talk about it very directly. And, you know, they just have the PowerPoint there just to have the points and stuff like that. That's perfectly fine, but no, no less than three PowerPoint slides, I would say. Um, and I would say no more than 10 10 slides because it's only about seven minutes so um because i know people would also prefer to read off the slides and stuff like that so that's the powerpoint um so i know 
So it was just mentioned to do a, a documentary. Excellent. I actually want y'all to get creative with it. You know what I'm saying? Like me personally, if it was up to me, we wouldn't be doing PowerPoints. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, I do have it included because I know not everybody is a videographer or a rapper or whatever. So you know I'm still keeping that option there. But I, I allow for um, custom made documentaries or a performance, a skit, or any other pre approved presentation styles to be included because I want y'all to explore your passions and your creativity outside of school and outside of um, criminal justice. Like these are things that, because one thing about society now that, that we all have to understand, even if you do have your main hustle, whatever it is, whatever field you end up getting into, you should still have your side hustles because number one, in today's society, it's not like back in 1970 where you could live off of one job and that's a job. You know what I'm saying? Like now, especially if you're living in New York, you got to figure out two, three, four, five different ways to make income. You know what I'm saying? Obviously, you got your main source, but like throughout time, you want to develop other skills so that you could be like an entrepreneur and stuff like that. Um, that's why I expanded it like that. And also, if you're going to be in the field of criminal justice, these, these skills, because making a documentary or, you know, coming up with some kind of performance or whatever, these are skills that you can transfer directly into the field. As I mentioned earlier in the semester, when I was a case manager and I was doing presentations on, you know, job readiness or life skills or, you know, uh, drug, drug, uh, drug rehabilitation and stuff like that, I would include raps in it. You know what I'm saying? I would rap to dudes who on parole who just came home from doing like 10, 15 years sometimes. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like a tough, a tough crowd, but at the end, like because I was able to use certain skills that I do, I do on my own anyways, I do for free anyways. It's like, at the end, I ended up building a different type of connection with the individuals that, that I was working with. You know what I'm saying? And it makes your job so much more so much easier and so much more uh, fluid overall. So I like I like the fact that you brought up um, that you want to do a documentary. Go for it. And any creativity that you add on to your to your presentation, I'll give you extra points for that too. Okay. If you wanted to do a PowerPoint, but you wanted to include a short spoken word or a performance or a skit or something like that at the end, you're more than welcome to do that. I'll give you extra points for that too. If you only wanted to do the performance, the only thing I ask you is make our seven minutes worth. <laughs> just, just I, I want to feel like I'm at Madison Square, like listening to Jay Z and Beyonce, you type stuff. You know what I'm now messing with you. Like, just make sure that like you know what you're doing and that you have, you know, what I'm saying like, like you really rehearsed and practiced what you're doing and stuff like that. I'm cool with you doing the performance or the skit all by itself, but it can't be it can't be a a cop out either, just because it's like quote unquote different. Like it gotta be it gotta be well done, well presented, and as long as that's done, it's, it's Gucci. You know what I'm saying? Um, and any other pre-approved presentation styles? Um, I had somebody reach out saying that they wanted to make a Jeopardy game. Uh, which, you know, I mentioned earlier in the semester, I had a student make one of those in, in my last semester, well, in, in fall of 2019. Um, yo, please be creative. Get, think outside the box. Do things that you wouldn't ordinarily think to do for any of your classes. I want you to think differently because when you get into the field of criminal justice, you have to do exactly that think differently. You can't follow what everybody's doing because many times, and as we're seeing, many times what everybody's doing is not even the right thing. Just because it's a law, just because there's a policy on it doesn't mean that it's correct, doesn't mean that it's right. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, I, I encourage y'all to think differently, do differently, and obviously if you got any questions, you could, you could let me know what's up. Um, in regards to the rubric, Basically, I'm looking at content. The top grade that you can get for this is a four. 
Uh, the presenter was knowledgeable of the information um, used in making the audience aware. Points lined up systematically and served their purposes. It all made sense. So basically, the information it it, it matched up um, with whatever your topic is based on visually. If you're doing a PowerPoint, the presentation was neat, organized, colorful, creative, and complemented what was being said. Um, you know, just add like the theme. It, you don't have to like make it look like like Picasso was assisting you in making a PowerPoint design and all that stuff. But you know, just make things match up and make it line up. Like keep the same font, keep the same sizes, and you know, things of that nature, and you'll be good in regards to that. It just has to be easy to look at and. Not like, wait, why Why is this letter bigger than that one? And, you know what I'm saying? You just got to line up visually. Um, problem solver, the issue and the solution were both directly addressed and communicated. And that's it, pretty simple, all right? This is the issue, this is the solution. Um, and then clarity, the presentation was steady, consistent, uninterrupted, and was easily received by everyone. I'm not looking to see if you know, when you're talking, it's like you're, you're dancing by chat, you're like all over the place. I'm looking to see if you know your information and you understand your information and that you're putting it out as best as possible. I know people get nervous. I know that for some people presenting is not their strong suit, but the reason why we're doing presentations is because when you're in the field, you have to get comfortable with talking in front of people. Unless you're like an IT person, you know, or data analysts that's sitting behind the computer. And even then, you still have to talk to your managers and your higher ups and let them know, yo, this was good, this was happening, I, I, whatever. Like, this is why I want y'all to get used to this presentation um, style because ultimately, you're gonna need it for the field. You're gonna need it for the profession and just actually just kind of know where you're around it. You know what I'm saying? So. Um, as long as you know your information, I don't care if you stutter a little bit or if you stumble on yourself a little bit. The main thing is just have the information come fluently for the most part. Um, and it just needs to look like you know what you're talking about. Not, not like, it, it, it doesn't need to look like you just gathered information last minute, just threw it on there, and now you're struggling to put the information out there, you know, through your presentation. This makes sense? Yeah. Y'all have any questions, any comments, concerns? So far, so good. Uh, I want to present by here, by Zoom. So it's fine. I have to do the PowerPoint presentation too. Okay. Your, uh, your presentation, um, we're going to have it done via Zoom. Yeah. Um, but if, if you want to do it through your laptop or your phone, that's perfectly fine. Um, the main thing is you just need to be able to share your screen. The same way that I share the screen on my side, you need to be able to share the screen on your side so that we can look at your, your PowerPoint. Um, okay. Also, if it's easier, you yeah. can pre you can pre-record yourself. You know ah. what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like You, you can pre-record your, your presentation before we even get to the to the class and then you just send me the link and then I'll create like a folder where basically I have the links to everybody's presentation and then I just I just post it there and then people can just click on those links um and see the presentations for themselves. Okay. You know what I'm saying? So we could do one or the other. We can obviously present live on Zoom or you can Free record yourself in advance, and then you just send me the link. So like you um you would have you would have to upload it on YouTube, and then you know you you could put the setting in private, wh whatever you're comfortable with, and then you send me the link, and then I post it up on Blackboard for people to see. Okay, professor. Sounds cool. Yes. Copy. Uh, any any other questions concerns before we get into the lesson? Okay, um, so like I said, try to get started on this today if you haven't already. Um, if you submitted an outline and I still haven't gotten back to it, you'll be receiving feedback on it today. Um, and so 
you know, just be on the lookout for that. All right, so we're going to get into the topic for today. Today we are talking about gentrification. I do not know why this happened. Okay. I promise there is always something. Okay. Um, for the discussion for today, who who is our discussion leader? I guess our discussion leader is not here today. All right, that's cool. Um, so before getting into the actual material, why do you think I included gentrification in the um, in the syllabus? Um, be, I don't know, like maybe because of like crime and stuff like that. Like, um, you know, it's like a, a person that moved into the area sees like a person of color and then they just profile them, you know, maybe that's why. Yeah. No, I see you. Um, yeah. So I think that when it comes to gentrification and police, um, since since now there's gonna be like you know white people moving in, um, you know communities of color. I don't know whether to expect more policing or less of policing. Definitely like um, rebuilding, you know, remodeling of you know certain structures. Um, you're, so so it's just gonna be um, I don't know like strange to see how police are gonna, you know you you're gonna see um just interaction with like well at least in my side i want to see like i, I want to see how police interact with like the white people and and um people of color in the same area you know is i feel like there, there could be like more communication like and you know if, if we can network with like these people these white people you know there, there's there's a chance that um you know you could see a change in, in police, especially with like protesting and defunding of police. That's really I think um, maybe it's incorporated because like, I'm from Brooklyn Bushwick, right? That's like a area that's big on gentrification for a while now. They even changed the name to East Williamsburg, you <laughs> well, know? So, <laughs> so, you know, maybe it's because or what I've experienced, you know, white people moving on the block, on my, one of my old blocks I, that I used to live on, that's heavy on crime, you know, heavy on gang activity, deep boys still outside, and now you got the white people calling the cops. On, on, on communities that, you know, black and brown folk have always lived in before, it, before gentrification ever even took place. Um, I mean, that's, that's all valid, and for those exact reasons, that's why I did include gentrification in, um, in the syllabus, because when we think of violence, we only think physically, right? Like, oh, snap, I, you know, Casanova, punch you in your face, uh, uh, knock your teeth out, right? Like that type of stuff, but at the end, violence is systemic, you know, poverty is violence, you know what I'm saying? People don't think of it like that, like, like, like when you have people at the top keeping people at the bottom poor, that's violence. If you can't eat, if your stomach is touching your back because you're hungry, that's violent. You know what I'm saying? Like that's that's pain that your body is experiencing and not always completely by your own fault. You know what I'm saying? In a lot of cases, not by your own fault. And so it's important to talk about these things because Gentrification is a form of violence in itself because obviously the government, um, you know, provides loans and provides uh, financial backing to a lot of uh, real estate companies and, you know, approves a lot of their proposals and stuff like that. But if a, a person of color was to ask for a loan, you know, to start a small business or, you know, to buy a house or a property, something like that, they're more likely to get rejected by the bank or by by the government than somebody from the white community. 
You know what I'm saying? And there's been many experiments that have been performed on, on, on this reality, you know, showing somebody from the white community with the same exact income and, you know, lack of crime as somebody from the community of color, like they're actually more likely to, um, to get approved for certain things than, than people from, from the community of color. So uh, that's a reality. Obviously, uh, violence can be passive too, you know, like this, this aggression, like there's like, you know, you think like, you think of a pit bull or a rottweiler, like, uh, you know what I'm saying, like DMX, I'm up in your face, barking at you, like you think that's aggressive, but there's also like passive aggressiveness where it's like, you know, kind of going back to, um, to PTSD, we were talking about the different forms of trauma, one of the forms that we talked about was racism, right? Like you, there's, there's microaggression. There's passive aggressiveness. There's like these forms of aggression in a lot of cases can be just as worse as the overall aggression that's put out there because um, continually just like swatting an issue away and like, ah, oh, nice, nah, you know, I think it's in your mind or this is like that passive aggressiveness or my, you know, microaggression where it's like you're sitting on the train, you know, or, or, or like you, you see that the train is um is packed or whatever, and there's one seat available, and it's next to a white lady, and you happen to be somebody who's melanated, and you sit right next to them, and then the person literally gets up and just goes on the other side of the train, like right there. That's that's microaggression, like no question. Like I wouldn't question it. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like, well, oh, why why you got up once I sat down? You know what I'm saying? Um, like that that's that's a form of microaggression and. That microaggression and the awareness of privilege, right? Because I'm sure, I'm sure most of us have already seen that video of the of, of Karen out at Central Park, right? Where she calls the cops and she's she's threatening um, a black man, telling him, um, "I'm going to call the police and I'm going to tell him, I'm going to tell him that a black man is mm -hmm. recording me and harassing me and stuff like that." Like they're they're aware of their privilege. You know what I'm saying? They're aware fully of this privilege, which is the only reason that she mentioned that. You know, and I'm sure she probably lives around the area because that's kind of, that's kind of like what a lot of white folk do who go to Central Park and, you know what I'm saying, like, at least like she came off as like the type of person that probably lived nearby that area, and, you know, whatever. But either way, the fact of the matter is, um, there's a level of awareness that they won't admit to you know what I'm saying? Um, that that basically they know that they have a certain level of privilege. Let me let me look up this name real quick because I I forgot her name, but I think I forgot her name. But basically, there, there's this um this woman, this white woman who actually fights. Or, you know, for a long time she was fighting against um, racism. And, you know, she's white, so obviously she's coming from a different angle than somebody of color. Um, Who's she, she Jane? A, uh, what, what, what's her name? Her name Jane Elliott. Jane Elliott, yes, yes. Um, Jane Elliott, she was a, well, she's a white woman that basically came to the defense of, um, of the black community. And she had a, um, a meeting with people specifically with like an all-white audience and she asked them you know would any of them want to be treated the same way that black people in america are treated and literally nobody raised their hand in the whole auditorium you know what i'm saying and, then, and yeah and then basically she she came with the follow-up question so you guys do know that black people are treated worse than anybody in america you know what i'm saying like she just like she hit him with, with the okie doke, the slam dunk, the reverse, whatever, you know what I'm saying? She came with all them angles and stuff. And it obviously exposed, you know, that white folk are very much aware of their privilege, whether they want to admit it or not, you know, because on, on Instagram, you know, and, and even social media and stuff like that, a lot of white folk try to argue, like, what white privilege are you talking about? I'm not a, uh, I'm not a, a, a billionaire or this and that, but... White privilege in a lot of cases is um, it's just the fact that, how do I put it? Like, white privilege is just 
the fact that you know that you that if you encounter police, you're not gonna get killed. Where if you're if you're a person of color, automatically you have to kind of have your antennas up because statistically speaking, the numbers prove that you know you're gonna end up probably getting physical uh, physical force being used against you, whether you're a male or a female. Um, let's see. So I'm going to share the screen. Give me one second. And I, I included a TED talk in this conversation, but again, I'm not sure how, how it was gonna sound on your side. Um, but if, if anything I could try, I could try playing like maybe a minute of it and y'all let me know if y'all can hear it. Is that cool? Yes. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna play this and we'll see how how the audio quality sounds. In New York, San Francisco, Chicago, other major cities across the country, people are talking about gentrification. Recently. I've been speaking to people randomly about gentrification. And one thing I learned is that people have generally heard the term, but they're not quite familiar with what it exactly means. Um, can y'all hear that clearly or? No, it sounds like a lot of static. Yeah. Yeah, I, I hear it too. I just wanted to make sure y'all was able to hear it. Um, all right, so what we'll do is I'll, I'll end the class like 10 minutes earlier so that that way y'all can check this video out. Um, it's one of the links in the in the syllabus under gentrification. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go over some of the other articles and stuff like that and then y'all can just check this out on your own time. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I did see the um, the response in regards to Jane Elliott. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if she is a liberal um, because of the fact that no, 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 no. It wasn't that. I was talking about the lady from the um, from Central Park. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean that that situation too is like you often get those types of individuals too. I mean. Being, li being liberal can be interpreted in different ways because, of course, um, liberal usually means progressive, right? But it's like progressive towards what? Like progressive yeah, towards their own agenda. Exactly. And progressive means something different for everybody. Um, Malcolm and Muhammad Ali always put it out like, you know, the person that you need to be weary of or that you need to be mindful of is not necessarily the the blunt racist individual but it's the it's the liberal who you know wants to tag along and be part of all these marches and and you know physical exactly. protests and stuff like that but they only go with you only only so far only up to until you know the issues that you continue to protest about no longer affect them you know what i'm saying only up to the point that their bottom line is met if if getting on the same train as you gets them to a certain point, then they'll do it up to that certain point. You know what I'm saying? But it's, it's like, um, for me, one of the best examples is, uh, you know, the, the the fight for women suffrage. You know what I'm saying? Oh, like, yeah, that. Like mm -hmm. women, women equality. To me, that's like, I think that's the worst form of it in, to, you know, in today because you know, you have the feminist movement and stuff like that. And it's amazing that, you know, women have fought so hard to get certain privileges and rights given back to them that are just pretty much human rights in general, right? But um, but the fact is that now you have to get into the deeper question that are these women who are fighting for feminism, you know, the, the white women specifically, are they fighting for white women or are they fighting for women in general? Because... Mm -hmm. We already know, statistically speaking, if and if, if we don't know, I'll, I'll put you on real quick. Um, 
just, you know, basic things like the health field and the way that uh, black women or women of color are treated in contrast to white women, you know, fatality rates, you know, after giving birth in the black community um, compared to the white community. It's like, it's, they're, they're not on the same level. You have more women of color dying from, you know, from giving birth than somebody from the white community. And a lot of that has to do with the lack of access to, you know, quality health care and things of that nature. I think I mentioned even before in, um, early in the semester, the, the, the father of gynecology, I, I mentioned that before, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Like you had this, this dude, I forgot his name. And honestly, I don't even want to know his name because I'll probably just punch him in his face uh, and knock his seat out. <laughs> um, the fact is that he was out here performing experiments on, on, on slaves, you know what I'm saying? And not even using anesthesia to like at least keep them unconscious. Like he's like operating on, on these women, um, you know, while they're still awake, you know what I'm saying? Obviously they didn't consider black women to be women during the time, unfortunately. And that's why they mutilated them and did, did things to them that today would, would be considered one like a, a huge crime you know what i'm saying but um you know white women have have black women to thank for you know the medical practice of gynecology being so advanced you know from all the lives and sacrifices that were given throughout the process and um ultimately you know this the fact the fact that new york i think it was like a year or two ago instituted a law that made it unlawful to discriminate against somebody because of their their hairstyle. The fact that a law had to be made about that just pretty much tells you everything. And it really happened like, I think like a year or two ago. You know what I'm saying? So at the end, um, a lot of these individuals who claim that they're liberal, that that's not necessarily always the best thing. Sometimes it might even be worse because they're closeted. You know what I'm saying? Like they, exactly. they'll, they'll behave as though they're with you, but when you least expect it, you're not gonna see them no more. Or when you least expect it, you know, they could they could side with the op or whatever, whoever the op is at that moment. But, um, Their first line is, I voted for Obama. I'm not racist. <laughs> yeah. you know. they'll, they'll go to the stereotypical thing like, oh, my, my, yeah. sister, my sister married a black man or, you know, something like that, where it's kind of like, like they're reaching to get that that approval from the community, you know what I'm saying? Um, but you know, this is kind of what it is, unfortunately, and we just have to call it out. And now that we got, um, you know, technology, we could record them. We could put their face on Front Street. You know, everybody gonna know Karen. <laughs> they gonna know Karen, and they gonna know Ken. So that's what it is. Um, how to predict gentrification? Well, I don't even think I have. I just said this because it's the New York Times, so we'll skip that one. Um, so this is from the Management Sloan School. New study basically shows gentrification triggered a 16% drop in city crime. Uh, when a neighborhood gentrifies, residents can expect safer streets, but not everyone will get to stay and reap the benefits. So obviously as a result of gentrification, and Mel alluded to this earlier, and um, it was mentioned by, by several people, um, Basically, when white folk move into the community, um, even though even though uh, people of color have lived in these communities for a minute and crime was never addressed really when they were in the community, now that these white folk move in who got money and who got privilege and, and connects and stuff like that, when they call the police, it's, that's, it's basically an amber alert as far as most people are concerned. You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, snap. The, Throw the salvage, throw the radios, send the SWAT team, you know, whatever the case is, like, for, for somebody from the white community, law enforcement will go above and beyond to make sure that they're protected and safe, at least in comparison to the community of color. Um, and we saw this, this example very clearly when we talked about guns, right? The fact that if you're a victim of assault, the closure rate of your case, if you're a person of, of color, um, is way less than the white community. And then if you get shot, you know, like like assault be, be getting shot specifically, but then 
if you get shot and killed, your closure rate drops down even more as a person of color compared to the, to, to the white community. Now, both communities drop down significantly, um, you know, in regards to like getting shot and, and still alive, uh, alive, <laughs> getting shot and still surviving, getting shot. But at the end of the day, the numbers still drop more significantly for communities of, commu communities of color, showing the level of prioritization that police and that the government puts over black and brown lives, right? Um, and it's pretty much out there. Like, there's kind of no disputing it, and it all is out there for people to, to realize and make sense of it. Prior to 1995, more than one third of Cambridge housing was subject to rent control. Um, well, so, so they're talking about situation in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So basically, the backdrop of it was um, a paper authored by MIT Sloan Assistant Professor Christopher Palmer, along MIT professors David and Parag Pathak, um, all economists look at what happened when gentrification accelerated after rent-controlled housing abruptly ended in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1995. They found that not only did crime drop 60%, it resulted in measurable economic gains for the city. Uh, prior to 1995, more than one third of Cambridge housing was subject to, to rent control. Those units rented at 25 to 40 percent below what other comparable units did. After rent control ended, property values in Cambridge rose significantly, 18 to 25 percent for previously rent controlled units, and 12 percent for units that had not previously been rent controlled. Um, the researchers studied this in a 2012 paper on the spillover effect on the end of rent control that found that overall it accounted for nearly $2 billion of the value appreciations um, of Cambridge residential properties by 2004. So governments oftentimes already have incentive to allow gentrification to happen because when, when gentrification happens, that means there's less rent control. That means that they have the opportunity to benefit from, from property taxes and to benefit, you know, from all these different uh, uh, what's it called, generations of income because whatever it is gentrification happening, right before the gentrification, you'll probably have a Starbucks, you'll probably have a Whole Foods, you'll have like some very big name brand stores moving into the community, which that in itself is going to bring more revenue and more funds and stuff like that. And so in that happening, the government's going to reap the benefits of that, you know, from the, from the corporations. And then obviously, you know, when you build brownstones and you build, you know, high rises and condos or whatever you're building, it's like, it's just going to continue to add to the government's revenue. They, they already said that from 1995 to 2004, uh, basically there was a, about $2 billion appreciation of, of property value, you know, for the properties in Cambridge, you know, and obviously in their mind, the crime also drops, and it dropped by 16%, which that's a, you, you're going to feel that. That's a significant percent of crime dropping. You know what I'm saying? It's obviously not 100%, it's not 50%, but 16%, you take what you take in regards to crime dropping. You know what I'm saying? Who, does, who doesn't want less crime in the community? Like, let's, let's keep it real. But um, obviously, they're going to just continue to, to ride off the back um, of, of gentrification and they're not really going to address it and there's going to be all these different loopholes policy wise and you know at the end of the day the people that are able to you know bid or or you know try and get certain properties in, in, in the bidding process usually already have money you know it's very difficult for somebody from the bottom you know to be able to get into a bidding war with somebody who already came in with millions of dollars because they got generational wealth or because they already have a circle of investors that all came from like upscale lifestyles and stuff like that. So um, while the Cambridge police agreed this was likely the case, no scientific research existed to corroborate the theory. Uh, uh, they determined that crime dropped by an extra 60% because the end of the because of the end of rent control, saving city residents on average uh, 10 to 15 million dollars annually. Of the $2 billion total appreciation of Cambridge housing, uh, Cambridge housing value attributable to the end of rent control, approximately 10 to 15 percent or 200 million was due to, to public safety improvements. Um, so basically, you have to take into account that when there is crime, 
that means that people are going to lose money, right? If people are, are stealing or if people are getting into shootouts or things of that nature, you know, and, and obviously bullets fly through, you know, the storefront or whatever, like that's property damage right there. Vehicles, all that stuff, that's property damage and, and buildings and stuff like that. And all of that has to be accounted for at some point. Uh, graffiti, you know what I'm saying? Like we see it on the trains, we see it on billboards, on buildings. Like all of that is property damage. And obviously crime, not only is it going to keep revenue from coming in from a corporal uh, standpoint, but you're also talking about just on a regular life-to-life -life basis, like property gets destroyed, it gets defaced, um, you know, and people are, are losing instead of gaining. And, you know, it, it makes sense. All of it honestly makes sense. But crime at the end of the day exists because there's a lack of investment in those communities. There's a lack of investment in resources and opportunity, um, underfunded schools, lack of um, recreational programs and activities, over-policing, sent into communities, sent into certain communities more so than others. Like, at, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, all of this adds on to the, um, to the issue of poverty because where there's poverty, automatically there's gonna be crime. That's just what it is. It don't even gotta be in the black and brown community. This is true in the white community. This is true in other, in, in, in other countries. Um, it don't matter where you go, wherever there's po poverty, there's going to be crime because people are going to do what they feel they have to do in order to survive. And if the government is not standing with these people and they're not standing behind them, supporting them in whatever ways, and they're already being taxed to death, you know, whether it's through their job or whether it's when they buy certain things or whatever, and they got to pay taxes on it, it's like, the, the mentality of a lot of people is like, yo, why, why, why continue to play the good guy role when, you know what I'm saying, that's getting me nowhere. So it makes sense at the end of the day, whether it's to be agreed with or not, that's another conversation. But ultimately, there's, there's a, a psychology and a way of thinking to everything, kind of just like what we talked about yesterday. It's like a whole cycle. It just keeps repeating. Exactly. It's, it's definitely a cycle. Um, and it's not a cycle that happened by accident. That's the thing to keep in mind because people just wake up and they think this is what the world is, but this was all set up like this systemically and structurally. You know what I'm saying? Again, going back to our, I think it was yesterday or the day before we talked about it. When, when Europeans came to this country from Britain or from different parts of Europe, they weren't, like, they weren't looking to provide rights and equality to, um, to African slaves or to the native indigenous population that existed here already, they were only looking to provide certain rights to themselves. And so when the constitution was created, uh, when the amendments were being, you know, ratified and stuff like that, at the end of the day, they didn't have, they didn't have um, communities of color in mind at all. You know what I'm saying? And so obviously that's going to affect how policy continues to be created throughout the years because you're talking about a whole country was thinking like this. You're not talking about just like one or two individuals. A whole country was thinking like this. Like, no, nah, we're the only ones that are worthy enough to receive any of these rights. These other people that we brought with us or that already existed here, they're savages, they're Neanderthals, they're animals. They don't even, they don't even have a, a soul as far as we're concerned. God doesn't recognize them. You know, and, and that's the irony of it because America, quote unquote, was a Christian society in the beginning times. You know, obviously we see it in the dollar bill and God we trust and you know when, when we pledge when we pledge allegiance to the flag and stuff like that, you know, there's mention of God and the higher power and stuff like that. So ultimately the uh the thinking was so deep. The thinking was so deep that you even had this idea of manifest destiny. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Does anybody remember what manifest destiny is? Manifest destiny. Mm -hmm. No, enlighten me. So manifest destiny, it was an idea created by, um, by, by the white Americans that were already here, like, I think it was like during the 1800s. Yeah, it was in the 1800s that basically 
God had allowed them to take this land, which is why they were in the position that they were in. And that's why they need to continue to take more of the land, which is why they were trying to expand slavery out to the West. So originally slavery, like originally America was made up of 13 colonies, right? And these colonies were located mainly on the East Coast because the East Coast is closer to Europe. All right, that's why nothing on the West Coast was certain, you know, was used for slavery and stuff like that because at that time there was no planes, no trains, stuff like that, you know. So like for you to get to the West Coast, like it was gonna it was gonna take you a hot minute. So everybody was on the East Coast. You had New York, New Jersey, uh, the Carolinas, you had Georgia, you had Florida. You had certain states in the East Coast that were already being used for, for soil for slavery. Manifest Destiny said, we're going to take this further out west. So they basically tried to take and, and expand slavery out west, but they were claiming that God was giving them that land. So they were using religion and they were using faith to basically establish themselves as being God's chosen people. And that black folk, that Native Indians, Na Native Americans, that they're not apparently under God's favor, you know, because they're not the ones that that are on, that are on top at the moment. You know what I'm saying? And so we can see a lot of that same thinking happening in gentrification. Many people are not attributing it to God, but the superiority complex of I can move and expand into whatever community I want to because I'm privileged and I have money and stuff like that. That could that. That thinking still continues to this very day, unfortunately. Um, they, um, professor, they yeah. were they were prisoners too, you know, when they first came here. They were banished. You know, this was a penal colony and they were prisoners as well. So uh, you you're, you're talking about the uh, the white community? No, like the what's it, the Protestants that came here? They were prisoners. The yeah. the king sent them well. The king banished them to here. It was a penal colony. Yeah, I mean, in, in a lot of cases, that was the case, but you also had, um, you know, people who were just straight up colonizing. Like, they, they were sent by the government in Europe to originally expand and to basically, you know, make this part of, of Europe, you know what I'm saying, or part of whatever country they, they, they were representing in Europe. But the American Revolution came as a result of people saying, we're tired of doing this work for y'all and y'all taxing us heavy, you know, we're, we're going to start throwing tea off of folks <laughs> or whatever, however they chose to protest and stuff like that. Um, at some point, they no longer wanted to do the bidding of what the government was selling them to do back in, in their homeland, like their original homeland and stuff like that. But you're right, they definitely were prisoners and they were sent in exile. Um, you had a lot of indentured servants as well who were actually white, but the difference between indentured servants and slaves were that indentured servants were, they were paying off a debt, where slaves, they didn't have a debt. They were just basically being owned. They were being used as property, but indentured servants weren't viewed as, as property. They were basically working. It's like, it's like when you go to a restaurant, you eat the food, and then you don't have the money on you. They tell you you gotta clean the dishes or something like that. That they're they're working to basically pay off that debt that they owe. And you know, obviously in some cases they could still get bamboozled. Like they could still be like, nah, we're not giving you your freedom. But the the idea is supposed to be that once they once they do a certain amount of work, um, they're basically supposed to be freed up from um, from from that debt that they supposedly owe. Um. So basically, what does what does it take to see gentrification before it happens? Um, so basically, the question is, how can you tell if a neighborhood is being gentrified? Is it the art gallery that appears next to the bodegas? Is it the hipster coffee shop opening up where the old deli used to be? Um, maybe it's the expensive locales rising up across the, the older row houses. Uh, the problem with many of these obvious indicators is that by the time they appear, it may already be too late. So oftentimes, we think, oh, this is the first time gentrification is happening, but by the time that that one thing already happened that you consider to be a sign, several other things already happened. Uh, there's a, a condo right down the block, or there's a, a brownstone that was developed, or 
whatever, whatever. Like, um, like for example, the Harlem they got, I think it's like close to like one thirty fifth. It's like, it's like by by one of the P's that's out in um, uh, out by Frederick Douglass Boulevard by like one thirty fifth, like close over there. Um, they got they got housing projects right there. It's like right across from the school, but then right across from those housing projects, you got condos. And it's like, like geographically speaking, it doesn't even make sense for you to put condos right across the street from projects. But clearly it's basically telling you a story. Like gentrification has gotten, has become such a part of New York culture that it's like people, like back in the day people wouldn't, prefer not to be living across the projects or whatever, you know what I'm saying, for fear of safety and stuff like that. But now it's like gentrification gave people like like this protection or like the sense of like, oh, I'm Gucci, I'm good. Like, you know what I'm saying? I know I got the law on my side and you know what I'm saying? And so like developers, they go into these areas and because gentrification is already happening, it's like, we could just build over here and build over there. And you know what I'm saying? Eventually basically just continue to expand and all that. Um, but what if what if there were a way to see gentrification long before the cop, uh, coffee shops, condos, and the homes disappear? What if was, what if city planners and neighborhoods had an early warning system that could sniff out the changes just as they began? Um, in that way, cities might prepare for the coming changes. So overall, it's kind of hard to be able to tell um, because again, as by the time that, that certain things come into fruition, it's like it's already kind of too late. Um, so what does it take to see gentrification before it happens? The most obvious leader is housing prices. Uh, cities have always done a pretty good job of keeping track of property sales. That is why the, that is why those records have for many decades been the primary data set for studies of neighborhood change. Um, but big data has already swept through the housing price field as apps like Zillow and Trulia allow anyone to, anyone to access real estate information going back years. Using a data science technique called machine learning, computers can analyze patterns in these real estate records and extract future trends. So basically using the, the pricing of different housing and stuff like that. So at the end of the day, it all comes back to housing anyways. Housing comes back to housing, right? Whether it's housing in a condo or in a brownstone, it comes back to just the housing that existed before it. Looking at the prices, looking at the trends. Oftentimes that, that is, a fair indicator as to whether certain businesses are coming in. And once those businesses come in, basically you already can kind of assume and assert, yeah, this place is getting flipped right on its head. Um, Zillow, I don't know if anyone's used Zillow before, is basically a app to look at properties and real estate. Um, you can start looking at, um, at what properties are valued at, it's free. I actually have Zillow just to kind of like get a sense of like, how much properties are worth in different areas. Um, and you know, if there's a property that you're interested in, you can reach out to, to a broker or whatever, and then basically um, start talking about potentially moving in into that specific location. Um, New York City gentrification, creating urban islands of exclusion study funds. So basically New York, we already, I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with the, the topic of redlining. Is, is anybody familiar with what redlining is? Isn't it when um, you don't, you don't allow um, people to live in a certain location based on their race? Yeah, that, that is a big, I mean, that's pretty much what it is. Um, so for example, when you look at housing projects, like a lot of housing projects, for example, like Let's take the biggest housing complex in the United States in Queensbridge, right? I don't, I don't even know if y'all even knew that that Queensbridge housing projects, which that's where Nas is from, Mob Deep, um, and a couple of other rappers. That's actually the largest housing complex in the entire United States. It's here, it's here in New York City. If you look at Queensbridge housing, it's literally located like it's called Queens Bridge because it's located under the bridge, which a bridge is basically hovering over water, right? That's that's the purpose of having a bridge to go over bodies of water. So Queens Bridge is located literally right by the water because 
usually the land that's by water is like it's marshy it's very mushy it's not good soil you know what i'm saying like it's not good soil to live on i should say because when you live by water automatically you expose yourself to the possibility of mold or you know different breathing related problems that can that can arise lead exactly um metal rusting you know which obviously you start inhaling and it, it affects your breathing that's why they found in studies that um you know people that that come up in public housing have a higher you know a higher tendency of of you know, growing up with asthma than somebody who did it. You know what I'm saying? Um, they redlined Queensbridge. They redlined, you know, a bunch of communities to keep them on the outskirts of the city. You know what I'm saying? That's why, like, when you look at even just the, the, the MTA, when you look at the train system, why is it that it takes 15 minutes from 14th Street, Union Square, to get up to 125th in Harlem? But if you try to go from Coney Island to 14th Street, it's going to take you an hour. You know what I'm saying? Or if you're coming up from, uh, what's it called, from like deep in the Bronx or whatever, it's going to take you an hour to get down to 14th Street. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, and, and at the end of the day, it's all based on geographics because they already know that a certain population lives in a certain area. And so we have to cater to the needs of those people faster so they can get to and from work at a faster rate because these other communities we already know that they're lower income they're not going to bring as much revenue quote unquote and so we gotta we gotta move how we move and so certain communities get redlined and they get cast out because they don't really want these communities to get involved and this has been some this was something that was implemented decades ago this is before we was even born you know what i'm saying um but ultimately this affects the living conditions of, of people and how we live. Like even if you go to Far Rock in Queens, flooding flooding is a continual issue over there. You know what I'm saying? Because it's right by the water, right by the beach. And the way they develop that land over there is it makes flooding very easy. It's like some like something you you have to go to Florida to experience literally happens in New York because of the way that they design the infrastructure in, in Far Rock. Um, with some caveats such as the time lag of census data and capturing population shifts and challenges with data data reliability throughout all the um, all of the region's neighborhoods there were several key research findings including in 2006 more than one third of low income households uh, lived in low income neighborhoods at risk or already experiencing displacement and gentrification pressures comprising 24 percent of new york metro areas uh, census tracts so like displacement, the word displace, uh, displacement specifically means getting moved out. It's, it, displacement means getting pushed out from somewhere, all right? Um, so basically more than a third of low income households lived in low income neighborhoods, comprising 24% of New York metro areas, uh, census tracts of people like getting displaced and at least feeling the pressures of gentrification. Um, over 12% over 12 of Neighborhoods in the region are gentrifying or in an advanced state of gentrification, uh, defined as an increase in housing values or rents accompanied by an influx of a high income, high educated residents, quote unquote, um, while almost 9% are experiencing displacement without gentrification. So basically, these are the stereotypical individuals that move in, you know, during the process of, of gentrification. So. Is people who, you know, have high income and quote unquote have high levels of education, but they're obviously not including that they're white as well in a lot of cases. So it kind of just comes with, you know, with the with the with the territory. In 2018, 515 census tracts in the region were designated as opportunity zones under a program that provides tax incentive for private investment in low income urban areas. So basically, you have uh, corporations, private investment firms that are basically given certain tax incentives and, and, and reasons to have to go into these areas and start gentrifying. So instead of providing breaks for the communities of color or the, or the low income communities to actually give themselves a chance 
to build themselves up. They're giving these tax breaks or these, you know, incentives to corporations in order to go into these urban areas and start investing and, and start flipping houses and things of that nature. Um, there are 314 super gentrified or exclusive neighborhoods in the, in the metro area or in the metro region forming or bring a very high income suburban and ex urban communities um, around New York City. In addition to creating islands of exclusion in Manhattan, Brooklyn and Queens, uh, most of these have long been exclusive but some 71 of these neighborhoods transitioned between 1990 and 2016 for low income areas uh, Abbeys to Abbeys with a medium household income um, at 140,000 was greater than 200% of the regional median in 2016. So basically, you, you have like, um, like certain Abbeys that experience gentrification much more than others. Right here is kind of showing you uh, some of the demographics. This map shows the Abbeys of displacement in New York City, Abbey. Um, Of course, the parts that are very red. Or, or the, the parts that are highlighted more in color are experiencing gentrification at different rates. Um, and ultimately, it's kind of just showing that, that it's happened at a very rapid pace, um, specifically out here in New York. I'm trying to see, I had a map somewhere. Okay, here we go. Um, so basically here um, on this map, Basically, it's on urbandisplacement.org. Um, when you look at the, the colors on the right, it kind of tells you the levels of gentrification that's happening and stuff like that. I'm not sure how to. So it'll, it'll show you certain areas um, experiencing gentrification more than others. I'm trying to see if it zooms in and lets me look at the actual parts of New York. I guess they expect you to know geography. <laughs> um, but yeah, basically we can see like in the downtown area because over here, where it's really red in New York, this is going from downtown um, right across Jersey City, basically, is going through the Highland Tunnel and et cetera, et cetera. If we look at, on the right, um, just like the measurement that they use color-wise to show you like the levels of gentrification, we see where it says VHI, uh, super gentrification or exclusion. So right here is showing you that the downtown area, right here, this is very much extremely gentrified. Um, it's pretty much keeping people out purposely you know, from communities of color. And, you know, it's not just, it's not even just super gentrification anymore. You can actually consider it to be exclusion, which like they're purposely keeping people out. And that's kind of just their main, their main goal and initiative. Um, let's go down. Can y'all hear me clearly? Is, is, the, is my audio like no, shaky? No, it's point? good. Cool, cool. Um, the map, the map show that some of these towns are indeed undergoing their own displacement processes and what might be seen as a quote-unquote ripple effect. In 2016, over one-third of low-income uh, of, of low income households lived in low-income neighborhoods at risk or already experiencing displacement and gentrification. Basically, we already went over this specific detail in the, in the previous one. Um, this is all just reiterating that. So here it says almost 8% of low-income households in the metro area are living in moderate to high-income uh, income neighborhoods that are experiencing advanced stages or super gentrification. Um, so you do have small pockets of people that are still living in these super gentrified areas, but that's probably because they've been, they've been able to maintain rent control from like the seventies, which, you know, like sometimes your, your parents, like your great grandparents or your grandparents, they pass it down to your parents. And then, you know, you happen to still be living in that, in that property. If it wasn't for that rent control or for the families passing it down, that spot that these people are staying at would have already been gentrified as well. Um, <clears throat> almost half of low income households live, uh, live in a low or moderate high income neighborhood, uh, neighborhoods that are stable. Um, almost 90% of public housing developments are located in low income tracks, but just 21% are located in tracks 
that are gentrifying. So now we have to take this into account too. Gentrification, at least the way we understand it today, it's been happening since maybe like around the 80s, probably before that, but as far as actual data is available to like really actually track it, it's been happening since like the 80s, it's, it happened in the 90s, but it didn't, it didn't really start taking off until like the late 90s, early 2000s, all right? So gentrification, the way we understand it today, it kind of just happened, like it literally like, it happened. for a lot of people, they consider it happening overnight because for the progress that, like for the different levels of progress that America has made for different things, usually it takes years and years, right? Let's talk about technology, like, Okay, now we see like a new version of a phone coming out like every year, every five years, whatever. But how long did it take from the first cell phone to the time that the first cell phone came out? It took almost 100 years, you know what I'm saying? And then in the 90s, you had the big brick cell phone that the drone looked like, it looked like a walkie-talkie you use, like if you're an aviator or something like that, like, roger that, or uh, 10-4, you know, whatever the case is. And then you go from that to having these no-pocket phones, then flip phones, and you have your sidekicks, you had your razors, motor rollers, whatever, and then now you got iPhones and Androids and stuff like that. Um, even that took time. Gentrification is a process that kind of seems to have happened just out of nowhere. You know what I'm saying? But a lot of this obviously is based on policy and the revision of policy as it goes. Um, so I know I said I was going to try to go at um, 10 minutes before the class finished, but I always just get on these roles, man. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just like that, man. You know, it, it, just, it just be happening. Um, just open it up to conversations for like the last few minutes. So we think about I have a question, Professor. What, what was that? I have a question. Um, today's assignment, today's reflection paper on gentrification. Can you explain what you mean by um, what are the issues with solitary as just come um, currently? I mean, solitary confinement or solitary as a how? Uh, you told me for today's assignment. Yes, there, there are today's reflected um, paper, the gentrification. Uh, let me let me see the look at it. You want me to share the screen? Um, no, it's okay. I'm, I'm actually right on it right now. I'm going to click on it and just make sure. The issues. Okay. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch up that question. I guess I put the wrong question in there accidentally. I'm going to add the correct question to it as soon as we get off, get off the Zoom session. So I would say check in like in an hour, just to make sure that the question is updated and stuff like that, which it, it will be. Um, but I'll be sure to change that after. I'm not sure why that, why that's there. I probably put it there by accident. Um, okay. Because when I developed the course, I had to switch things around um, at certain points, so that probably didn't get switched around. But um, but I, I'll be sure to, to change that like as soon as we get off the Zoom session. Okay. Yeah. Um, the condos are on high rise hills, so they can open up the projects. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like, it's like, I, it's, I'm not saying it in a good way, but it's kind of like poetic in a sense, right? It's like all of it is like, there's literal and metaphorical things that are happening all at once, you know? It's kind of like, yeah, you know, we, we can see, we can see the projects. We're coming for that next, you know. It's kind of like, it's kind of like mocking in a way, you know what I'm saying? And um, it's like um, I don't know if anybody listens to the Breakfast Club, but Charlemagne, like you know, he be he be out of pocket a lot of times, but sometimes he be saying things that are valid. Um, he was saying that when he sees these white folk kneeling now, because these these folk they were they were able to kneel years back. You know, when Colin Kaepernick brought police brutality to the forefront, nobody was kneeling. You know what I'm saying? Very few people were kneeling in general, but white folk, if they really believed this was an issue, they would have been kneeling back then. Now, obviously, everybody's kneeling. Um, everybody's talking about, oh, I'm in, uh, we see you, we hear you, I'm in solidarity with you, Black Lives Matter, this and that. Like, he makes a valid point where it's like, yeah, you know, he appreciates people doing these gestures, especially from the white community, to show, you know, the support and stuff like that. But sometimes he has to look at it and question, like, are they kneeling to support, you know, the same cause that Colin Kaepernick was supporting? Or are they, like, low-key, you know, hiding behind the image of kneeling and really representing the officer that was kneeling on George Floyd's neck? And so 
it's it's sad that you know that even thinking like that is not a far fetched idea. Like because clearly we see like the, the protests and stuff like that. You would think that things get better, but like if anything, we've kind of seen some even more egregious crimes and acts happen even after that. And we see another cop shooting right after that. You know what I'm saying? Let alone the hangings and stuff like that. So you know. It kind of, like, a lot of things are, like, very poetic, you know, and I think we talked about it, too, like, with Rikers Island. The fact that Rikers Island is named after a judge that used to send, uh, you know, free black folk who were never born into slavery down south, you know, to get basically kidnapped and, you know, sold off into slavery and stuff like that. Um, The fact that that's so out in the open and it's so obvious, like, it's so, like, in your face, like, like, they're telling you, we know you're not going to do the research. You're not going to know the background behind this, this this history. So we're just going to leave it right here to kind of like, this is basically like the flag on the land saying this is our land, kind of. You know what I'm saying? So I, I like I like that that uh, that analysis, Shay, where you were saying the condos are, are basically high, like overlooking the projects because it's not, like it's already proven it's not beyond them to kind of make mocking and jeering kind of gestures like that where it's like, yeah, they're probably doing it to, you know what I'm saying, to kind of like stroke their egos or whatever, you know. But um, the reality is we have to get educated on all aspects of the system, not just criminal justice, but, um, you know, financially, um, you know, economically, real estate, you know, food, dieting, stuff like that, you know, because at the end of the day, even when you think about... Um, you know, fast food places. There's so many of them located in, in communities of color. You know what I'm saying? Like, like black and brown folk die more often from, um, you know, from, from a bad diet than they do from getting shot by cops. So that in itself is also a form of institutional violence. You know what I'm saying? Because if you go back to the history of Africans before they got brought over on the Atlantic um, slave trade, their diet was primarily comprised of, like, you know, fruits and, and vegetables. Yeah, they ate some meat and stuff like that, but it was mainly fruits and vegetables, which I'm glad that now, you know, you have these different movements that are, are pushing and encouraging communities of color to start thinking about going green or at least like including more green in their diets. Like you got the hip hop is green movement. Um, you got Styles P, Jada Kiss, they opened up their, uh, what's it called, their, their, their fruit bar and stuff like that. Um, emphasizing health because at the end of the day once you lose that you pretty much lose everything you know so it's important as scholars as young scholars and, and students of criminal justice for you to see that um criminal justice is not only what they told us it is you know what i'm saying it's many other things as well all put together you know like crime isn't just what the law says is crime there's also human crime, there's crime against humanity, there's crime against the law, but there's also crime against your fellow man and, and your fellow human, your fellow man, fellow woman, whoever, like, like there's things that are civil and there's things that are human, that you have to look at it from all those types of angles, if, if that makes sense. Um, so, y'all already know, if you got any questions, you got any comments, concerns, just reach out to me. Uh, but before we go, you already know what we gotta do. So on the count of three, we gonna now say we go yeah, yeah. One, two, three. Yeah. 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 yeah you know about now. Nah, I, I need I need that again. I need that again. That was a little weak. Oh. We're gonna do it again. All right. Y'all ready? One, two, three. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. All right. That's a little better. So I'm I'm gonna let y'all go about your day. Stay safe in the meantime. And y'all yeah. already know. Okay, Madly. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, man, man, yeah. <laughs> that, that came like, they, so they already came and gentrified the community by the time you said that. Um, so, you know, if you got any questions, concerns, y'all already know, y'all can reach me. Stay safe in the meantime. Still and, on WhatsApp, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on WhatsApp too. So if you want to text through um, through WhatsApp, I, I check it, I check it throughout, you know what I'm saying, throughout the day as well, so. Okay. So, but stay safe and uh, I'll catch you mañana. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.
what you know, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but have a good one. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye.